right, well, to begin this morning, I'm going to ask you to, this is the part where it gets uncomfortable, I'm going to ask you to turn to the person or the people next to you, and I want you to share a couple things. Number one, I want you to share your political affiliation. Are you Republican or Democrat? I want you to share, I don't know why you're laughing, I want you to share who you voted for in the last election and why. What is your view on gun control, and do you think global warming is man-made? Ready? What? What's going on? No, okay, don't really, don't really share those things. Don't really share those things. No, I hear a lot of talking. Hopefully we're talking about other things. Stop, time out, time out, time out, time out. This is going really wrong. <laughs> no, we can't talk about those things civilly in church, right? Especially in church, we can't talk about those things civilly, politics and divisive issues. Can't, we can't go there, but actually we are going to be going there, not uh, amongst yourselves, uh, but from the front. For the next seven weeks, we're going to be tackling some really, really hard topics. And so we're asking for your prayers as we tackle some really hard topics over the next seven weeks. Because today we're starting a seven-week series called Divided. And I don't have to tell you that we live in, in, in a society that has this climate of divisiveness and increasing polarization. We have the talking heads on the 24-hour news channels, not only telling us how divided we are, but then demonstrating by the way they talk to one another. And we have posts on social media that we read occasionally that are just very divisive and, and, and kind of um, just demonstrate the polarization. I recently saw a, a post of a friend of mine who basically said, if you don't understand this position the way I understand it, then you are a blankety blank and unfriend me immediately. This is the kind of thing that we will read on social media occasionally. Or if you ever like read a, a news story online about a divisive issue and you go down and you have the courage to scroll through the comments at the bottom, you could see some of the anger and the divisiveness on so many of the issues. Polls are continually telling us that we are a divided nation and it being increasingly polarized. And polls are also telling us that this is one of the major concerns one of the top concerns of Americans is this growing divide and this polarization. Just consider some of the, the issues that divide Americans today. Issues like race. You know, I just throw out terms and it automatically creates maybe an emotional reaction in you or it brings up where you stand when I say black lives matter or blue lives matter or all lives matter or white privilege. I mean, these are kind of things that like will get people worked up very quickly. Um, things like women's rights and, and the gender inequality in our nation right now with movements like the, the, the Me Too movement and equal pay and equal representation for women. These are issues that will get people talking and everyone has their side. Issues like the environment. Most people would agree that something is happening in our environment, but then we, we're divided over what the cause is and if, is there anything that we can do about it? This will get people talking. Um, Immigration in America is another hot topic. Uh, right now we have a lot of people moving toward our country, and the question is, what do we do? Do we, do we send the military? Do we have a wall? Do we close our border? What do we do with immigrants who were born here to, to undocumented immigrants? Do we uh, deport them? Do we allow them to stay? Uh, how many immigrants should we allow into our country? Should we allow them from countries where there are radical Islamists, or do we not allow them to come in? Immigration is a hot topic. Not only that, but also the, the LGBT uh, community also the, and the issues that they, they fight for and stand for is a divisive issue in our nation. And then we could talk about gun control with the mass shootings in our, in our country. The, the people are divided over how to move forward. Do we need tougher gun laws in order to maybe get some guns off the street? Or is that infringing on our Second Amendment rights? Everyone's got an opinion, it seems, and everyone is dug in. And so these are all the issues we're going to be talking about over the next seven weeks. And we're going to be asking ourselves the question, what does the Bible say about these things? And really, what is my responsibility as a follower of Jesus in, in a culture that has this climate of divisiveness and polarization? Um, and so I hope you're going to be here with us because um, this is going to be an interesting journey. And today we're going to start with the perhaps most divisive issue in our, our nation, and that, of course, is politics. I wanted to show you a video that will kind of demonstrate, a very short video that will demonstrate kind of what we're talking about when we talk about 
polarization in politics. We are frequently told that American politics are polarized. On the right, Republicans work together with other Republicans. And on the left, Democrats work with other Democrats. But Republicans and Democrats don't usually work with each other. Polarization means that politics is us and them. To understand how bad it actually is, a professor at Michigan State University looked at the networks of every U.S. senator and representative since 1973. In the 1970s and 80s, the Democrats mostly worked together and the Republicans mostly worked together. But they still sometimes worked across the aisle to pass important legislation. Here's what it looks like now. The Democrats and Republicans almost never work together. We've been moving towards this kind of polarization in both the Senate and the House since the 1970s. But polarization can be even stronger when Republicans and Democrats actually try to undermine and attack each other. When this happens, polarization becomes us versus them. This research shows that even this stronger us versus them polarization has gotten much worse over the past 40 years. It's also shown that it doesn't matter which party is in control. American politics have grown more polarized under both Republican and Democratic controlled Congresses. It's time for a change. To learn more about this research, check it out online. So we see this polarization in politics, not just in the Senate, not just in the House, not just in our elections, but it spews over into so many different areas of our lives as well, into the conversations we have around the office, that everyone seems to have their own ideology that they fight for. We really saw this demonstrated recently in the, the, the Kavanaugh hearings um, for his confirmation to the Supreme Court. This was already a pretty interesting confirmation hearing, but it got even more interesting when, when Professor Ford came forward with allegations of sexual misconduct back in high school. And this would be typically something that you would want to just get to the, the bottom of and, and say, what is the truth here and, and how do we deal with it? But we saw very quickly that this just became a political circus where each side was defending their side from those on the Senate hearing committee to the politicians talking about it, to the reporters talking about it, to people talking about it around the water cooler. Everyone just wanted to defend their side and their person. But we have to wonder, would those on the right have been as defensive of the candidate had he been liberal? Or would those on the left have been as accusatory if he had been one of their own? Each side was seeking to defend their own ideology because that's the climate we live in. It's not about finding truth. It is about defending my ideology. It is me versus you, us versus them. And I begin to see that your position is completely illegitimate. And I begin to dehumanize you. You are less than human for having those. And I could say whatever I want about you now because you are less than human. And this is the climate in which we live. This is where the polarization is taking us. And in all of this, the question really is, what is the role of a Christ follower in a climate like this? On one hand, many people believe, Christians believe that Christians should just stay completely out of politics. This is not our sphere. We shouldn't get involved. We shouldn't vote. We shouldn't run for office. Jesus didn't run for office. Jesus didn't deal with politics. We should just share the gospel with people and, and let Jesus change hearts. And on the other side of the issue, you have Christians who believe that politics and religion are like inseparably bound together. Right? That, that my religion is kind of affiliated with my party affiliation. It's that closely bound together. And so please withhold your amens here as I say this, but there are many Republicans who just believe that Jesus was a Republican. Right? Of course he was a Republican. I mean, re Republicans stand for abortion and pro-life and they're you know, for you know, the freedom of religion and other moral issues. And, and Republicans talk about God and the Bible and quote it more than Democrats do. Clearly Jesus would be a Republican. And on the other side, you've got Democrats who are like, oh, of course Jesus was a Democrat. I mean, he was all about serving the poor and free health care for everybody. I mean, that was his entire ministry. I mean, it's obvious Jesus was a Democrat. And we've come to the place now, I just was uh, glancing through my Christianity Today last night and I found an infograph that said less than half of evangelical Christians who have a party affiliation in America believe that a Christian can be in the, the party on the other side. 
you can't be a, a real Christian and be in the other party. You know, I, I heard a pastor telling a story recently about a group of his, his parishioners who were actually having a conversation, and one, of the, one lady said, it's so great how we have all these unbelievers coming to church, these, these people outside the faith who are actually coming to our church, and someone said, well, how do you know? Have you met them? Or She says, no, I was just in the parking lot, and I saw bumper stickers from the other political party, so clearly these people are unbelievers. So the point is, is that there is a, a whole spectrum of ideas about where politics fits within faith. Some people say stay away from it. Other people are, I can't even separate my politics and my faith. But I would like for us to consider a third way to kind of approach the, the topic of faith and politics. Um, now, let me just say very clearly uh, and obviously, I think, uh, and honestly, that as we look at a lot of these issues, the Bible isn't super clear on all of them. On some of them, them, it is. But we're not going to be able to find a proof text for what we should um, do with gun control, the government should do about the environment, or whether we should be a socialist or capitalist society, right? I think the Bible speaks to all of them. All, every issue that touches life, the Bible speaks to. But not through proof texts, but through principles. Which means that we need to dig into all of Scripture and, 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 and while that's not easy, it's necessary. We need to look at the totality of Scripture. And as we look at all of it, and again, that takes time, it's not easy, but as we look at all of it and try to compile it as objectively as possible, then we start to build a theological framework and series of principles that could begin to guide us in many of the issues we're going to be talk about. And so what I want to do just this morning to start with is just to start to build that biblical framework that will bring perspective on the divisive nature of our, the nation we live in. And let me just tell you right now my intention. Let me just be really clear. Because, you know, my small group, um, they're kind of serving as a, a sounding board to this series. And, and I took them, you know, this topic last week, and we, we discussed it. And several of them said, we are afraid for you. This is going to make people so angry. And, you know, I'm kind of idealistic. I'm like, I don't see why this would make anybody angry, what I'm about to say. I mean, I don't, and if it does make you angry, I would love to hear from you. Tell me why so I can understand your perspective on why this makes you angry. Because my intention is not to tell anybody how to vote or what party to be affiliated with. That is not my intention at all. My intention is simply to bring a biblical perspective that is going to help us kind of understand where our role is and what our mindset should be in the midst of all this, and then just to give some practical counsel on how to move forward. I mean, pfft, why would that make anybody angry? I don't know. <laughs> so to that end, my first principle is this. This is a biblical principle, and thank you, Tim, so much for, for communicating this so well through our, our, our worship service, but my identity is in Christ, and my citizenship is in heaven. This should bring an incredible perspective for the follower of Christ. And these are indisputable uh, facts of, of Scripture. My identity is in Christ. We were singing about it, but what does it mean? What it means is that, I mean, I, I have many labels in my life. I am dad, I am pastor, I am husband, I am son, I am brother, I am, you know, whatever my political party or, or whatever, if you have that. I am a Rockies fan, I, you know, so many things. But the number one label that I wear is I am a Christian. See, Jesus said that if I want to follow him, I need to be willing to take up my cross and follow him. And the cross was a symbol of death, which means that old Dave is dying and Christ now is living in me. Paul said it best when he said, I have been crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me, which means that my life is no longer about me, but it's about him. It's no longer about what I want or what I think. It's about what he wants and what he thinks. He is my identity. And what that means is that he wants to consume all of me. He wants to guide all of me. He wants to have a voice in everything, including my politics. And so if my identity is in Christ, it means that I am a Christian before I am an American. I am a Christian before I am a Republican. I am a Christian before I am a Democrat. I am a Christian before I am a card-carrying NRA member or a progressive activist. I am a Christian before I am a man or a woman. I am a Christian before I am white or black or Asian or Latino. I am a Christian before I am gay or straight. I am a Christian before I am an immigrant or a natural-born citizen. Christ is my identity. 
This is going to form the way I, I look at these issues. More than that, my citizenship is in heaven. Paul put it very well in the book of Philippians. He put it so clearly when he said, but our citizenship is in heaven and we eagerly await a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. What he's telling the Christians in Philippi as well as us is that this world is not our home. That we belong to a different reality, the kingdom of God. And it's coming soon and he's gonna take us there so we could experience our full citizenship. And what this means, if, if you're a follower of Christ, what this means is that this, this, this should give you a unique perspective as you think about political issues. It should give you a kind of a, a way to differentiate from the issue somewhat because this world is not your home. This country is not really your home. You are a citizen of heaven before you're a citizen of America. You know, I'll, I, I travel quite a bit internationally and, and I'll often find myself having discussions with people in other countries about their politics and policies and things that are happening. I'll be talking with someone in Italy about the unemployment rate in, in Italy or a Rwandan about a uh, constitutional amendment that they're getting ready to vote or someone in Nepal that they're getting ready to vote yet another constitution. And the funny thing is, is I always have an opinion, usually, about which way the government should go or how people should vote, what's in the best interest of the nation. But the amazing thing is, I don't get too worked up about it. Why don't I get too worked up about it? That's not my nation. That's not my home. That's their issue. I care about these people. I mean, it has some weight. I care, but I'm certainly able to differentiate. And, and I hope the point is clear. The application is clear for us. If our citizenship is in heaven, we're, not, we're able to differentiate from a lot of these issues because while we care about them, ultimately, this place is not where we're ending up. This is not our home. And so um, this is the, the first, I think, thing that could help shape our perspective that, that um, when, when Facebook comes along with a, a post that's, that is kind of lambasting me or whatever, or a, a poll says that I'm on the outside looking in, I'm on the margins of the way I view things, or someone doesn't accept me because of a, a view that I have or a statement that I've made, that I'm, I could be okay with that because my identity is in Christ. I'm a citizen of heaven. You know what? I am loved. I am accepted. I am redeemed. I am saved. I am a child of God. Right? It's okay. Right? So, a little perspective. Next, thing that we could look at here is not only the fact that my identity is in Christ and my citizenship is in heaven, but let me just tell you, God's kingdom will never come through the political process. Can we, can we just be honest? I mean, let's just get perspective here. I mean, we as followers of Christ are all to be all about the kingdom of God coming on earth as it is in heaven. This is what Jesus told us to pray for. Pray that God's kingdom would come. Because when God's kingdom comes into the heart of a man, woman, or a child, it changes everything. That means he is now king of me. That he's changing me from the inside out. He's transforming my heart. He's making me more like Jesus. He's giving me the ability to love and, and forgive and be generous and to live according to the values and, and, and the, the, the law of God. The kingdom of God is what we are to be about, and it's very clear that the kingdom of God will never come through political process, not in its totality. The political process cannot change a human heart. It is only the gospel that can do that. And, and the Bible makes this clear in so many ways. If you just look at just the history of man and how kingdoms come and go and, and how every political process is deeply flawed, some more than others, you can see that God's kingdom is not coming through them, but one, point, one uh, prophecy I would point to that really illustrates this well is found in Daniel chapter 2. In Daniel 2, uh, God gives this king this dream about this image that is made up of five different metals, you know, gold and silver and bronze and iron and iron mixed with clay. And God tells this king that each one of these metals represents a different kingdom, a kingdom that's going to come and a kingdom that's going to go. Babylon's going to come and go. Medes and Persians are going to come and go. The Greeks are going to come and go. The Romans are going to come and go. Then you're going to have divided Europe. And then this rock, not cut by human hands, it strikes the image in the feet and just destroys the image, pulverizes it, and then that rock grows into this huge mountain that lasts forever. And God tells them, that's the kingdom of God. The rock is the kingdom of God that's going to grow and fill the whole earth, and it's going to last forever. And what God is telling him and us is that kingdoms of man will come and go, and we're going to have our shot to try and establish this great you know, political system on our planet. But in the end... They're all going to be dust, and God's kingdom will ultimately come, and it will be eternal. And so this is bringing us this, this, this perspective, this biblical perspective, that um, 
the kingdom of God will never come through political process. So then the question is, what do we do? Do we do nothing? I mean, if the kingdom of God will never come through political process, if I'm a citizen of heaven, if my identity is in Jesus, does that mean that, that I must be on the side of the people who say, you know what, Christians shouldn't even get involved in politics? Well, I think there's another side that we have to look at as well. Um, we don't do nothing, but we do something. And we could point to lots of biblical examples as well. This is why we have to look at the totality of Scripture. We look at and see how God raised up Joseph as a political leader to save his people, or all the counsel in the New Testament telling Christians to pray for and support government leaders and to obey the government, submit to the government, so that things would go well with us. Let me just point to one biblical model that I think is beautiful, that really gives us a metaphor for what we're called to today. You know, most have probably heard this verse, I think even Pastor Edwin used it last weekend, from Jeremiah 29, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Jeremiah 29, 11. But do you know the context of that verse? Babylon had just destroyed Jerusalem. God said it was going to happen, and he, God used the Babylonians to go and completely level the temple, the city. Most of the Hebrews had been killed in the destruction of, of Jerusalem, but the, the Babylonian government takes some of the Hebrews on a thousand-mile journey back to Babylon. They're being held there against their will. They're now living in this crazy land, very different from their own. This is not their home. They're far from home. But then along comes God, and through the prophet Jeremiah, tells them that they will only be there for 70 years. But after 70 years, God is going to send them back to Jerusalem. They'll be able to rebuild, restart, have a fresh start, and they're going to be restored to where their true home is. And so their question in the midst of all this is, well, what do we do while we wait? Here we are in this land that's not ours. They're pagan land. We don't really identify with these people whatsoever. We've got 70 years to kill. What do we do? And that's where God comes, and in Jeremiah 29, tells them very clearly what they should do while they wait. And this is what he says. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to those I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. So God is speaking to his exiles living in Babylon. He tells them this, build houses and settle down. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there. Do not decrease. So you can see what God is telling them. Saying, yeah, you're going to be there for 70 years. Live your life. Build houses. You know, raise your family. Be a part of the, the culture and the society. And then he tells them something that must have sounded really, really um, shocking to them. But he tells them this. Also, seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. And they would have been like, oh, time out, God. <laughs> Do you know who you're asking us to, to seek the peace and prosperity of? The Babylonians? These people are pagans. Do you see who they're worshiping? Do you see what they're eating? Do you see how they're living? How could we possibly seek the peace and prosperity of this nation? Besides that, they killed all of our family members and our friends. They devast destroyed the temple. They, they leveled the holy city of God. How could we possibly seek the peace and prosperity of this nation, of this city? And God tells them, pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. I want my people, I want my people to prosper. And so pray for their prosperity and their peace because as they have it, you too will have it. And then he tells them, this is what the Lord says. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. So the point is, it's clear to these, these exiles living in Babylon. What do we do? We're not citizens of this country. We don't really feel like we belong here. We feel like we belong back where our home is. What do we do? And God tells them very, very clearly, pray. Seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile and pray to the Lord for it because if it prospers, you too will prosper. And in that seeking the peace and prosperity, it's an active word, right? Be engaged. And so this, I think, speaks very clearly to us today. We would call ourselves exiles. Our citizenship is not here. But it's in heaven. So what do we do while we wait? We seek the peace and prosperity of the land in which we live. As they prosper, we too will prosper. Again, this is uh, a principle that you will find all throughout Scripture. 
And so let me just kind of summarize what I've shared so far just with this idea of perspective. Should a, a, a Christian be engaged? How important are politics? Yeah, a Christian should be engaged. A Christian should care. But not that much. This is weighty stuff. But it's not that weighty. Right? This is the tension that we're called to live in. Yeah, we want to seek the peace and prosperity of the land in which we live, but our identity is Christ and our citizenship is in heaven, and we know the kingdom of God isn't coming through politics. And so we can kind of enter into this kind of this arena of politics with some care and concern, but not the whole weight of the world on us. If things don't go our way, it's all right. That's going to happen. And so what I'd like to do just with our last few minutes together is just then share with you, what are some things that we can do then to seek the peace and prosperity of the nation in which we live? How can we as Christians really serve to bring healing and unity in the midst of a very polarized and divided environment? So I just want to share some things with you. And the first one I'm going to share with you, I don't have a Bible verse for this. Matter of fact, this is just my opinion. And if anything, this may make you angry. I don't know. But I'm going to share it. Again, this is just my opinion. But number one, can we rethink social media as a way to share your political views? Can we, can we do that? Okay, well, I mean, there's a couple. Um, let me, let, let's just say this. Um, our, our, our nation is so polarized right now, and, and just like a, a fuse is waiting to be lit, and things just blow people up. We need to understand that right now, studies are showing uh, there's a small minority of people who are on the far left who are vocal and very active politically. And there's a, a small minority of people, not a small, these are not small minorities, but they're minorities, a minority of people on the far right who are active and vocal. But what all, all recent studies are showing is that the majority of Americans make up what are called the exhausted majority. <laughs> now, you resonate with that if you're part of it, because you're like, yes, I like that. I am exhausted. I just didn't know I was part of the majority. But yes, two-thirds of Americans call themselves the exhausted majority. We are exhausted at the bipartisanism. We are exhausted at the agendas. We are exhausted at people just defending their ideology, not knowing who we can trust or where we can go for truth. We are exhausted at all the bickering and the bombs being thrown at one another. Right? And so let's just... If, if I use social media to, to, to post my political views, here's the reality. First of all, I am probably on the far right or far left. Right? And that's okay, but just know if you're posting, you're probably in one of those spheres. And here's what's going to happen. All of the people who are in your minority are going to applaud you and say high five. You're going to get their comments. I agree, right? The people on the other side, right or wrong, are going to dehumanize you and say, well, you're just a blankety blank and you don't get it because that's the culture in which we live. And everyone in the, major the exhausted majority is just going to roll their eyes and kind of scroll right past. And so... I think maybe we need to rethink whether social media is the best place to share our political views. Not only that, because it also affects our Christian witness. Because here's the thing. Most people probably know you're a Christian, and they know I'm a Christian. And when you post your political views on social media, what ends up happening is that people, right or wrong, are going to just associate that view with all Christians. Right? That's the kind of tribal environment in which we live. All people think alike in that, that tribe, right? So if one Christian thinks that way, all Christians think that way. The reality is, not all Christians think the way you do, right? And so what happens is, when you post your view, maybe I agree, maybe I don't, but now, all of a sudden, everyone thinks, I think that too, and now my witness has also been compromised because I'm a Christian and you're a Christian, and now all of us are kind of affecting the witness of everyone else, right? So what if we rethink just whether social media is the best way to share our, our political views? Again, it's not right, it's not wrong, it's not sin, it's not immoral. I'm just wondering if it's the wisest thing to do. My opinion no Bible verse, all right? Number two. Now we'll get a little bit closer to, to, I think, what I could be confident saying the Bible would be behind. But how about this? Humbly learn from those with differing views. You may be surprised to learn this, but there are a lot of people out there who see things differently than you do. And, uh, they have different um, opinions on the issues that matter so, so, so much to you. Is it possible... I mean, just, is it possible that people who see things the polar opposite than I do have something to teach me? Is that a possibility? Now, what would it look like to become a humble student who learns from people who have alternate views? What if every Christian in America 
just all of a sudden said, you know what, I'm going to become a humble learner. I'm going to seek out people who have alternate views than me, and I'm just going to say, tell me how you got to that position. Help me understand. I mean, what would happen in our country if just Christians did that? I mean, the kingdom of God would come if we were willing to just do that. So let me just ask you, have you ever sat down and talked to someone who is an undocumented immigrant and just asked for their story? Have you ever sat down and talked to a person of color and asked them about whether they've been profiled or not? Have you ever sat down and talked to someone who is a conceal and carry and asked, why is it so important to you that you carry a gun? Or sat down with a homosexual and said, why is it so important for you that you have the right to marry? And just hear the stories. Let me, let me just tell you, it probably won't change your opinion. But I would be willing to guarantee it will change your tone. It will change our tone. Because be, but behind every alternate view of mine is a person made in the image of God who has a story. And those stories can teach us. They could soften our tone. They could give us humility. How about number three? Allow the gospel to move you away from partisan politics. Oh, man, I wish I had more time to really unpack this. This is big. But really, if you, if you and I understand the gospel, I believe it will make us more moderate in our politics. Because the two-party system really is a beautiful thing. I mean, Republican, Democrat, there's truth in both sides. And there's beauty in both sides. But what happens is we get locked into our ideology and we just stick with our party versus saying, you know what, I'm going to stick with Jesus and see where he takes me. Because when I, when I move toward Jesus, he starts saying, well, there's truth over there and there's, there's truth over there. And why don't you just, rather than asking, what does my party think about this issue, ask, what does the Bible say about this issue? Right? Or what do I think or feel about this issue? Since my identity is in Christ, I would ask, what does Jesus think or feel about this issue, or rather than asking the question, is Jesus on our side, or is Jesus on my side, ask, am I on Jesus' side? I'm going to say this really slow. I think this is really important, but we need to allow Jesus to reshape our politics rather than allowing our politics to reshape Jesus. So many of us have... have shaped a Jesus that is just in the view of our political party. We need to allow Jesus to reshape our politics versus allowing our politics to reshape Jesus. How about number four? Share and vote your views, just not on social media. All right. A healthy and a vibrant democracy requires an engaged public, a public that includes people of faith. You and I are called to be salt and light. We are called to have biblical opinions, opinions that reflect the kingdom of God and the heart of God. And so we need to be willing to share those. We can't hide our light under a bushel. We can't just pray that God's kingdom would come on earth and his will would be done. Jesus wouldn't ask us to pray for it if he didn't want us to actually engage in the process as well. And so we can't allow our voice to be silenced through through marginalization or, or, or through fear, we have to share our view. Just not, just in ways that would keep dialogue open. That's what's so important. And that has everything to do with tone and posture, right? You could talk to anyone pretty much about anything if you have the right tone and the right posture. Again, the tone being one of, of humility. I just want to learn, right? And then the posture is when I share my views with you, I'm going to share them tentatively. I'm not going to share them as though I know everything about the issue or I'm absolutely right. It's just this is where I am. I'm open to be persuaded otherwise. And if we have that tone and that posture, we can keep almost any conversation going. Um, and that's what we're called to do. Can we be humble in our dialogue? And, and share our views around the water cooler, bringing up conversations with people who maybe have differing views, and just say, hey, let's just talk about it. Let's learn from one another. But also we need to vote our views as well. We need to be engaged in the process. We can't allow our vote to be silenced. I think Tim Keller said it, to not be political is to be political, right? If I say I am not going to vote, just imagine you are a Christian living in the 1850s, the most divisive time in our country's history, and your Christian says, you know what, I'm just not going to vote. I'm, I just don't want to get involved in politics. Well, then you are actually voting in favor of slavery. 
you know, if, you, if you're not voting, you're keeping someone in chains because your vote is not there to counteract the vote of someone voting in favor of slavery. To not be political is to be political. We need to engage in the process and vote our, our conscience. We just need to go to the Bible, ask what would, would God have me do, and then follow through on that. And then number five, and this is one I got lots and lots of Bible verses for. I'm so confident and convinced on this one. But in the church, love your brothers and sisters in Christ regardless of their political views, right? We need to be the church. I am so sad to say that after our last election, I talked with people, I heard from people who didn't want to come to church because they were convinced that everyone here voted for one particular candidate and that they could not be in community or fellowship with a group of people who voted for this particular candidate. And I just have to say, that is not being the church. That is being just like the world. And it's not realistic at all. I mean, if you look at all studies on church, the Adventist church, the Christian church, is pretty much divided right down the middle nearly. And, and New Day is kind of the same. I mean, we have all kinds of views here. In this room right now are people on opposite sides of the abortion issue, the immigration issue, the gun control issue, the LGBTQ issue. I mean, it's all right here in this room. You have someone who thinks like you, and you have someone who doesn't think like you right here in this room. But if our mutual identity is Christ, that comes before anything, and that comes before everything. We are commanded to love one another no matter what. Now, think about this. Jesus himself, when he assembled his 12, he brought the political polar opposites into his 12. Maybe you didn't know this. He brought in a guy by the name of Simon the zealot. And the fact that he was a zealot meant that he wanted to overthrow the occupying Romans. He wanted to take up arms and kill them. That's how much, and anyone who stood with them, that's how zealous he was. And in the same group of 12, Jesus also calls Matthew the tax collector. Matthew is a Jewish guy who denied his own people, betrayed them, and actually began to collect taxes from his own people for the occupying government. And Jesus puts them both in the same 12. One guy wants to kill Matthew, and Matthew's just like, but they're able to live together in community because Jesus brought them together. And that's beautiful, isn't it? So let me just ask you just one more kind of probing question here. Do you feel more comfortable with people who share your politics but not your faith? Or do you feel more comfortable with people who share your faith but not your politics? Of course, you'd be like, well, I'd like it to be both if I could. But that's not going to happen in the body of Christ, right? Do you feel more comfortable? If, if it's number one, then there's a very strong chance that you have allowed your politics to shape your identity more than your faith. That your politics are becoming an idol. And let that not be. May it not be so. In our polarized climate, one of the best things we have to offer the world is the love that we have for one another. This is our greatest testimony, that Jesus is in our midst. And despite all of our differences and all of our different views and all of our different stories and all our different voting records, that he would bring us together and that he would make us one. What a beautiful, beautiful thing. This proves the power of the gospel more than anything else we could point to on the planet, that a group of people from every walk of life, every color, every socioeconomic group, every political ideology would say, you know what, that doesn't matter as much as Jesus who is in our midst, that we belong to him, right and left and, and pro-life and uh, libertarian and, and moderate, and we are Christians. So could we together, could we rethink political posts on social media, humbly learn from the other side, allow the gospel to move us away from partisan politics, graciously share and vote our views and love one another despite our politics. And in this way, we can be a part of the solution in a climate, in a culture, in a nation that is increasingly divided.